is, let's jump into freedom of the press, right? Three questions here again, right? Why protect freedom of the press? When can government restrict the press? And how should courts treat student speech on the internet? Is that speech or is that press, right? And ultimately, we know this defines, this, 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 this question rests on how we define press, okay? So let's jump into it, right? Here we go, starting with the text yet again. We've already read the text. It's pretty much the same when it comes to press as it comes to speech, right? Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, right? So that's not really helping us a whole lot. We know that there's a freedom of the press. We don't really have any details of it here. So let's, uh, let's get into the purpose of freedom of the press. Here's the cartoon that you no doubt are sick of seeing. It was on the lecture of freedom of the press. It was on your quiz about freedom of the press. Here it is in your review of freedom of the press, right? The idea is that the press is an important institution that we need to protect because it brings us information that we need to participate in the democracy, that we need as citizens in a democracy to have in order to vote, in order to, to engage uh, with one another in political discussions, right? So here we have newspapers kind of holding up the infrastructure of democracy, and they're falling, right, maybe to criticism of the press. But the idea, right, is that that's why the press is important, right? It's a kind of like a fourth check on government, right? So we talked about the internal checks and balances, right? The press is kind of like an external check on government, right? Here we have the history of freedom of the press, right? We talked about this, right? We talked about 1798, the Sedition Act, right? The first major debate over what freedom of the press means, right? This is the moment where, where it's not the Supreme Court, but rather the national legislature that's getting into the weeds and trying to say, is it okay to suppress the press? Is it okay to prevent the press from criticizing the government? And ultimately, right, the way that this country came out, the way, that, the way that, and we saw this in the debates that the founders had early on, was no, you can't simply silence the press because they're criticizing the government. That's, that's not fair, that's ridiculous. That is not what the Constitution, uh, the Constitution should not allow that, right? Remember, that did not happen in the Supreme Court. 1798, the Sedition Act, that was a debate that happened in the national legislature, in Congress, right? And then also, you know, in the media itself, the press was debating this as well, right? Um, the Supreme Court really, uh, you know, it stuck its toe in the water in the 1930s when it came to free press, but it didn't really get heavily involved, didn't dive into the free press waters until 1964, when we come to New York Times v. Sullivan, right, which is mentioned in your book, but only briefly. We talked about it in more depth in class, right, and it's the same principle. The idea is silencing criticism of government is unconstitutional. You can't suppress the press simply because they're criticizing the government. In that case, remember, we're dealing with L.B. Sullivan, right, in, in, from one of the parties in the case, right, who was a uh, public safety commissioner down in Alabama who felt like he was being depicted unfairly in a New York Times advertisement that was criticizing Southern police officials for their behavior during the Civil Rights Movement, right? He thought that was unfair. He wanted to stop them from doing that. And uh, Justice Brennan, right, who this program, the Marshall Brennan program, is named after, in what many people consider one of his most important opinions, says, no, 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 that's not a good reason for silence in the press. They must be allowed to write about public officials, right? Okay, 1971, the Pentagon Papers, right? Another very controversial, very famous case, right? You remember these two, uh, you know, these reporters uh, had uncovered these important classified documents. They wanted to publish it. The government was saying, you can't publish that information. It's going to jeopardize our national security, right? And the Supreme Court was, you know, it divided on this question, but then most of them generally agreed, national security, if that's the government's interest, that's a good reason for suppressing the press. That's okay. If national security is at stake, if people are going to die, right, then it's okay to suppress the press, right? This was, this was the WikiLeaks discussion, right? Which you all saw was in the news just a couple of weeks ago, right? The Iraq papers that were released, right? The question is, you know, can, can WikiLeaks be regulated as press because they're jeopardizing national security? This is a question, right? It's an ongoing question, right? But the Pentagon Papers case is where that question first arises. And then, of course, 1988, most recently, Hazelwood, right? Which is in schools, school-sponsored speech, school-sponsored student press, right, can be regulated as long as the school has legitimate pedagogical purposes, right? And that's really what I want to focus on here, right? Um, on your test, right, is what are student protections of the, what, what's, what, what protections do students enjoy when they're engaged in the press, right? So, so let's just remember, right, when can the government restrict the press? Well, there are two main reasons, two main interests that the government has in restricting the press. One, national security. Two, protecting students or promoting learning in schools, right? So that's, of course, Pentagon Papers and Hazelwood, right? Those are the two reasons when the government can restrict the press, right? Um, what about student speech on the internet, right? Is that press or is that speech, right? Remember, the reason this is a question is because there are two views of the press, right? The press can either describe people, the people that produce the news, the media itself, members of the media, or it can mean technology, 
right? It can mean the actual mechanism of distributing the press, right? So we talked about how, you know, what is the press? And we said, oh, you know, right now the press is television news, it's newspapers, it's radio journals, it's online media, right? And we can look at the people that produce that. It's, it's Walter Cronkite, right? It's Woodward and Bernstein, it's Terry Gross, it's Perez Hilton, right? It's bloggers, it's uh, radio interviewers, it's, it's newspaper reporters, it's television anchors, right? Um, those are the people of the press. Or we can also say the press is the technology itself, right? Television satellites, radio towers, internet cables, or printing presses, right? Remember, it's a technology, right? Uh, the founders probably thought it meant technology, right? That's why we called it freedom of the press, because to them, the press was the printing press, right? So the equivalent of the printing press today, you could say, is the internet, right? This is the, the forum in which most people now publish their views, right? So if that is press, right? If anything on the internet counts as press because it's published, then how do we treat student speech on the internet? Is it just speech or is it press, right? And this is the question that Killian tries to answer, right? And, and what happens in Killian, right? Killian, we have uh, the student, right, with the top ten list, right? He, he emails it to a bunch of friends. He's making fun of a teacher. I don't know why anyone would ever want to make fun of their teachers, but this is what he does in this, in this case. It comes to school. Um, people think it's funny. The teacher's offended. Um, and the question is, is uh, you know, how are we going to treat this, this paper, the, the, this top ten list? Are we going to treat it as speech and apply Tinker? Or are we going to treat it as press and apply Hazelwood? And what does the court do? Both. It applies both, right? Because the court has no idea what to do, right? So it does both tests, right? And it says in the end, um, you know, this is this is okay. It didn't cause a substantial disruption, and the school did not have a legitimate pedagogical purpose for, for regulating. So in this case, it didn't end up mattering that it applied both. But the point is, right, we need to be able to identify when, uh, you know, uh, when Hazelwood applies and when Tinker applies, right? Um, and generally, we know that the rule is whether, the, the rule is uh, in deciding which, which test applies, is the speech school sponsored? That's the key question, right? If it's school sponsored, which test do we apply? Um, Hazel, Hazel. Good, right, what would you call it? Hazel, Hazelwood, right, exactly, Hazelwood, right? If, it, if it's school sponsored, right? If it's not school sponsored, then we apply Tinker. Which test is better for students? Nicole? Um, Hazelwood. Hazelwood is better for students? Um, Tinker, right? And why is Tinker the better test for students, more protective of student rights? Because, um, well, it's, well, the test is, um, no disruptive. Good. No Good. Substantial disruption. Good, right. No substantial disruption, right? And what is the test under Hazelwood? Um, it's that funny pedagogical purposes, right? Right. So, so Montreal, do you want to jump in here? Help from co-counsel? You were raising your hand or not? Oh, pedagogical purposes? Right, okay. So, so remember, right, uh, forcing the school to say that this is disruptive is easier than forcing the school to say, I have a reason for regulating this, right? So tinker is better for students, right? That's one of the key points here, right? So if you're arguing on behalf of the student, as you might well be on your midterm, you want to try and squeeze this into the tinker test, right? So you want to try and say, this is not school-sponsored speech, tinker applies, right? The broader tinker protections. Um, so remember, the, the three take-home points here, right? The Supreme Court has created one test for student speech and one test for student press, right? Tinker versus Hazelwood. The tinker test is better for students, right? The Hazelwood test is better for schools. And courts haven't yet figured out, you know, exactly when they should apply each of these tests to when it comes to student speech on the internet, right? So good. So those are the important points when it comes to fitting with the press. And now just briefly, church and state.